our God who has created us in your image and has called us to live together as your children. Create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Let us pray. Spirit of God, who gathers the church into one body, gather us again in your presence. We confess, O oh God, that we have not held the gospel in trust, nor have been diligent to share the good news. We sometimes substitute empty words of flattery for gentle messages of truth. We have nursed our grievances rather than the people who need our care. Grant us the will and the courage to change. Bless us with the grace to cooperate with one another in love and in service. Teach us to show compassion to those in need and to face challenges with imagination. Lead us to meet disappointments with prayerful trust. In the name of Christ we pray. something or growing something or building something but what's that something that we're building it may sound a little archaic and grandiose but I think what we're doing is building the kingdom of God and by the kingdom of God I mean those conditions inside ourselves and out in the world that are the way that God means them to be where we follow the great commandments to love God and to love each other. For me, the church is a setting for two things, learning about the kingdom of God and building the kingdom of God. I've also learned that it doesn't always go in that order. Often for me, doing the building results in the learning. And so we're here asking you to join us in thinking and praying about this. What can our church do in uh, making a difference in bringing about the kingdom of God? Let me tell you a story. I spent three Saturdays this summer working with our Carl Ports, who's the UMCOR uh, volunteer coordinator for this region. And by the way, uh, what a model of stewardship he is and what a respected man he is in the greater community because of that work. So we worked on home site cleanup after the June wildfire in Alpine. What that means is hauling away in buckets a family's lifetime material accumulation reduced down to ashes. Judging from the homes, foundations that we worked on, and the views that you could see, it was pretty obvious that these were prosperous families. But those ashes in these beautiful homes were worth no more than the ashes in the mobile homes a mile away. At one site, 
the wife and children evacuated on five minutes warning with only the clothes on their back and the cars that they, the car that they drove. And the wife had been unable to visit that site for many weeks without just breaking down emotionally. In the mere presence of people of faith, combined team of United Methodists and members of the Latter-day Saints drew her there and she fed us and she thanked us very deeply. She couldn't do it without some tears, but she was there carrying on in spite of her grief. And that day, I learned more about the kingdom of God while I was helping to build it. I'm sure that happened to people scores of times during labor for our neighbors. Um, I don't see the Sunday church here is where most of the kingdom building happens. I've been told that there's uh, a place near the golf course uh, called the 19th hole. And the 19th hole is a place where people gather to swap stories and celebrate and inspire each other, carry on some traditions. But the real golfing happens out there on the course. We have the Sunday church because of what we experience here together in worship and in fellowship. And we carry that experience with us into the larger world. Our church provides me uh, with this, the setting and the tools and the examples and the support for moving principles that I have up here in my head here to my heart and into my hands. These are, for me, ethical principles that are uh, the spring from and are the result of God's uh, love and the really radical teachings of God in human form, Jesus of Nazareth. And some of these principles that I hold dearly are related to stewardship, ironically enough, today. One is the scripture in the book of Matthew that says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I think that's just a really interesting passage. It doesn't say what you, you might expect it to say about stewardship. So maybe something like, put your money where your mouth is. What it says is, is that we should put our hearts and our treasure into the church. We should put our treasure into the church so that our hearts will be there. I see that as bootstrapping my faith. I'm one whose faith has sometimes faltered, and I need that kind of bootstrapping. Another principle is Christ has no hands but ours. I don't think we should be looking for, for fire from the sky to change things. It's up to us. We're the ones who are called. We're the ones who are equipped to make a difference for the kingdom. Thanks. Good morning again. Today we invite you to give prayerful thought to the sharing that you do for this church financially. We are asking you to increase your giving in support of the wonderful ministries of this church. Often making a difference comes at a cost. It may be your time, your talents, or your resources. I wish that it rained down abundantly. The supplies for labor with our neighbor, or vacation Bible school, or the Sierra Service Project, or all those support teams that we send to help our neighbors after disaster relief. We have an exciting and vibrant church. We offer programs that run six, seven days a week that enrich our lives. Wouldn't change anything. But to make you comfortable in this learning environment, the air conditioner runs, the heat runs, water gets turned on, um, lights go on. Just like you, the church has bills. We pay our ministers 
and the support staff who work tirelessly to make a difference in our lives. We are the church, and it is your generous giving that makes this all possible. As we look forward to making our financial commitments for 2019 during the worship service next week, it's our pleasure to announce that there were advanced pledges from 71 households in our congregation, and we've already received pledges totaling $376,930. That puts us 60% at 60% of our goal. That's really a fabulous start. Our goal for this year's campaign is $629,000. That represents a 12% increase from this year's budget. We have over 200 households that support this church. So we hope that the remaining 130 or so households will join us in uh, combining with these initial givers and making a difference by making a generous pledge to this campaign. Together as a church family, we can make a difference. And I'd like to say just one more thing. I'd like to speak to those who support the church financially, but don't have a formal pledge, and those who don't give. Why is that piece, that pledge piece of paper so important? It's not a legal document. It's not binding. If your circumstances change, you can make it go away. You can change it. Yes, it's significant to the church because it helps us, I'm on the finance committee, budget for the coming year. But it is so much more than that. It is significant because it says that you have made a deliberate choice, a covenant, a commitment to include the church in your daily life. If you're a family, how wonderful would it be to have your child help stuff the envelope? Talk about it. Teach by example. Show your child that in this world, it is important to sacrifice and think of others. It's essential. So next week, when you bring in your um, pledge with you, uh, we hope that you will share as generously as you can. Take the leap, do something difficult, be the difference. Thank you. Psalms 34, 1 through 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continu continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in
gospel lesson is from the fourth chapter, the gospel of Mark. Generosity begets generosity. Stinginess impoverishes. Then Jesus said, God's kingdom is like seed thrown on a field by a man who then goes to bed and forgets about it. The seed sprouts and grows. He has no idea how it happens. The earth does it all again without his help. First a green stem of grass, then a bud, then the ripened grain. When the grain is fully formed, he reaps, harvest time. How can we picture God's kingdom? What kind of story can we use? It's like a pine nut. When it lands on the ground, it's quite small as seeds go, yet once it's planted, it grows into a huge pine tree with thick branches. Eagles nest in it. With many stories like these, he presented his message to them, fitting the stories to their experience and their maturity. <clears throat> Our hymn is My Life Flows On, number 2212. That's also in the Faith We Sing hymn book. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> Every day of the week, 
the programs that meet people at their point of need. This worship service where together we lift our hearts and voices to praise God. All of these things make us the church together. And this campaign invites our generosity in order that we may continue to make our church a place of transformation and an outpost for service. So today I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between stewardship and generosity. Now stewardship is sort of an old-timey word that still hangs around the church. I like the word and, and what it means, but I too have been hanging around the church for a very long time. <laughs> it's part of my ancestral vocabulary. But people who are new to the church may not have a, a frame of reference for what is involved when we talk about stewardship. Stewardship for most of us may be just this one month of the year when we focus our attention on the church's finances. But stewardship is an active means of expressing our faith. Stewards are people who are entrusted with caring for stuff. In the olden days, stewards were those who took care of other people's stuff. And the notion of stewardship carried with it a sense of duty and even legal responsibility. But stewardship without some passion motivating it is really sort of hollow. To become alive and vibrant, for stewardship to really be a means of expression, it needs a soul, a character. <clears throat> and that can go a couple of ways. I have been in some churches where the character of stewardship is stingy, frugal, self-protective. The stewardship campaign each year was nothing more than a slog of Sundays where tired people emphasize needs over hopes, where duty trumped joy, and frugality was a key virtue. It was actually a drag all the way around. And then I've been in other churches, and this is one of them, where the character of stewardship is vibrant. There's a generous spirit alive during this season. People are happy and excited about new opportunities. There's a sense of anticipation rather than dread. People share stories about how much they love each other rather than complain about how things aren't like they used to be. And I think the difference between those churches is the character of their stewardship. Where there's joy and purpose in giving, there is a character of generosity. And people who are generous make things happen that would not happen otherwise. Now, as most of you know, my family is going through a very difficult season. And we have been carried by the prayers and, and cards and generosity of so many people here and around the country. This is going to take me a while. <laughs> but I want to tell you something that happened just this last week. We received a care package from all the people that Package from all the people that used to work with Myron in Nashville. Now, many of them had met Jesse uh, because he had lived with Myron there for about a year. But those generous people had never met our other son, Luke. And when we received that package, inside of it was a letter addressed to Luke. And it contained two, two gift cards. One of them was for Southwest Airlines, so that he could come home numerous times to see his brother. Then the other one was actually even more precious to me, because though it was of smaller monetary value, it showed even more generosity. These people from Nashville weren't satisfied with getting Luke just from Phoenix to San Diego. They were going to get him all the way home. And so these people who live 2,000 miles away figured out that it takes two hours to get from Flagstaff to Phoenix. 
And so they sent him another gift card that would cover the cost of gas or a shuttle. Now, can you believe that? They didn't just give him part of a gift. You know, they didn't just settle for the first gift being good enough. This was a cup overflowing gift, extravagant, thoughtful, incredibly creative. And their generosity has made a great difference in our lives right now. Generosity is an action. It's not a spiritual attribute that one can acquire apart from the actual practice of giving. Generosity is giving so that you make a difference in somebody else's life. The scripture today is from the message translated by Eugene Peterson and, and begins with a well-known adage, generosity begets generosity, stinginess impoverishes. And then Mark goes on to give two very seedy parables that express the mystery of generosity. In the second story, a little seed, as small as is known, like a mustard seed, is sown in the ground. And over time, that seminal organism grows to bring forth a strong trunk and many branches and leaves. And in time, it takes on a life of its own beyond what that farmer could ever have imagined. And because the seed and its generous growth, great surprises then begin to happen. New life is made possible from that tiny seed when birds begin then to use the twigs and the leaves to build nests, and the cycle of life continues. If that seed had not been sown, what would have been the consequences? What life would have been missed? Generosity begets generosity. Dr. Hal Hansen loves stars, and he was eager to share that passion with his seven-year-old son, Jeff. One night, Hal took Jeff out with the telescope, hoping that that instrument would help him see the stars. But after struggling to see something through the scope, Jeff just looked up at the sky and asked his dad if, if he was able to see the stars without, uh, with just his eyes. Hal was taken aback. On that crystal clear night, the stars were in abundance. And he said, yes, Jeff, there are millions of stars. And Jeff, matter of factly, answered, I don't see them. And as Jeff made his way back inside his home, Hal sat down, brokenhearted, that his son, his only child, will not have stars in his life. And he wept, facing the reality that all the dreams he had for his son were slowly dying. At age seven, Jeff was diagnosed with neurofibromatosis. <clears throat> and this genetic disease causes stunted growth, various learning disabilities, and tumors to grow in different parts of the body. And in very rare cases, the tumors grow on the optic nerve, causing eyesight loss and possible blindness. And that's exactly where just one such tumor developed for Jeff at age seven. And as it grew, Jeff's sight became more and more limited. At age 12, Jeff began chemotherapy and radiation in an effort to halt that tumor's growth and to save some visage of Jeff's eyesight. It was then that Jeff decided to give the tumor a name, one that would make it seem not so serious or important. And so he named his tumor Claude, <laughs> like dirt Claude. It was something that could be made fun of, broken apart, destroyed. And humor became a tool that helped Jeff face the treatment and this emerging reality of his young life. Well, it was during the treatment that his mom, Julie, gave Jeff some paint and a brush. And starting with watercolors, Jeff found painting them to be relaxing. And Julie began using these cards and paintings as thank you notes to those who were helping them during this very difficult time. Many of them were members and staff of the Church of the Resurrection, a United Methodist congregation in the family belonged to in Kansas City. 
That congregation's generosity began to change Jeff's life in ways he and his parents could never imagine. This is his story. I have sold it to the million dollar mark. How many people in here can say they donated a million dollars to charity by the time they're 20? Jeff Hansen is an artist and philanthropist whose paintings hang in the homes of celebrities like Elton John, Patrick Dempsey, and Billy Joel. His work has raised over $3 million for charity, and he's only 24. Even more impressive, he is legally blind. Jeffrey was born with a genetic condition, neurofibromatosis, that's characterized by short stature, learning disabilities. Tumors can develop anywhere throughout your body in your nervous system. At the age of six, Hansen developed a tumor on his optic nerve, causing him to go blind. And in the midst of chemotherapy and radiation, he started painting. It was more so fun just to do that and, and uh, to have people come over and paint with me and just talk. As Hansen and his parents realized, he had a gift. They also leaned on their church family at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas. Members helped show Jeff the importance of giving back simply by being there for him in his time of need. They are our family. They have lifted us up in the bad times and they have celebrated us in the good times. I felt like after chemotherapy and radiation I needed to give back. My fundraising began at a glorified luminate stand at the foot of our driveway which in one summer raised $15,000. With the support of his parents and his church, Hanson kept at it and his paintings now sell between twenty dollars and $100,000 a piece at auction. $100,000! No art training, a kid who can't see the stars, a kid who can't ride his bike. We consider this a God thing. No one in the medical world was promising any happy ending to this story. Over the past 10 years, we've gone from Make-A-Wish to a world-renowned painter generating $3 million for charity. My core belief is every act of kindness helps create kinder communities, more compassionate nations, and a better world for all, even one painting at a time. Now, there are a lot of special things about Jeff Hansen. Um, at 12, he raised $15,000 at this bistro where he sold bread and, and his hand-painted note cards. He donated every cent to the Children's Tumor Institute. And as his talent developed, so did his heart for generosity. About this time in his life, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, approached, uh, which approaches not only terminally ill children, but also those with serious long-term illnesses, invited Jeff to make a wish, and they would make that happen. Jeff was thrilled uh, with the invitation, and he took it very seriously. It took two months to figure out what his wish would be. He decided he didn't want a trip. Instead, what he wanted was to meet somebody famous. But he didn't just want a celebrity. He wanted to meet someone famous whose life made a difference in other people's lives. So after a lot of thought, he narrowed it down to one person, Elton John. <laughs> Not only one of the most famous performers of our time, but also a world-class philanthropist who was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1998 for his charitable donation of $300 million through his AIDS Foundation. Jeff wanted to meet Sir Elton John. It took some doing. But a year and a half later, the Make-A-Wish Foundation fulfilled Jeff's dream by meeting Elton John at a concert that was taking place in Kansas City. And on October 13, 2007, Jeff and his parents were given VIP treatment and they got to visit with Elton John. But this was no ordinary meet and greet. Jeff and Elton John sat down and talked about Jeff's illness and his charity work. They talked about Elton John's AIDS Foundation and his philanthropy. It was an incredible conversation with an unbelievable ending. For as they got ready to take their seats for the concert, Jeff Hansen, Jeff Hansen, not Elton John, Jeff Hansen, reached in his pocket and pulled out a check that he had made out to Elton John's AIDS Foundation for $1,000. Jeff gave it to Elton John 
and said it was money that he had earned selling his note cards and canvases, and he wanted to help the AIDS children in Africa. From that little seed of generosity, a very special friendship was born that continues to this day. Well, meanwhile, back in Kansas City, when Jeff is not hanging out with Elton John, he's still raising money for the children. And Jeff set a goal of raising $1 million for charity by the time he was 20. He achieved that at 19. And his new goal is $10 million to charity by the time he's 30. As the video showed, his painting sells for between three and $5,000. Uh, and it's through that that he's now earning a living at age 24. But at charity auctions and benefits, his paintings often sell for between $15,000 and $20,000 each. What causes this remarkable return on his paintings? Well, I think they're gorgeous, for starters. But, and, and I have a book of his work that's out on the patio that you're welcome to peruse. But Jeff's story and his passion for helping others also inspires generosity in other people. Generosity begets generosity. Jeff could have been a kid defined by the tumor which took most of his sight. He could have felt cheated and defeated. But he chose to respond to the circumstances in his life with faith and with hope and with generosity. He states that his core belief is that every act of kindness helps create kinder communities, more compassionate nations, and a better world for all, even one painting at a time. <coughs> Jeff Hansen is a United Methodist making a difference through a spirit of generosity and compassion. Now this may seem like an unusually rare and wonderful story, but I think that every story of generosity rivals this one. They all contain a surprise, and that surprise, whether it's an unexpected gift from a stranger, or a check for $1,000 from a 12-year-old, or a spontaneous kindness that lightened another person's load is a surprise that makes a difference. One person's generosity makes a difference. This week we all have a decision to make about the ministry of which we are each a part. The ministry here belongs to all of us, and therefore every pledge of support makes a difference. There has been some incredible generosity shown thus far. And the pledges that have already put us at 60% toward our goal represents nothing less than love in action. So in the week ahead, I hope that all of you will prayerfully consider what gift of generosity the Spirit is yearning to bring to life in you. As a generous people, let us stand together and affirm our faith. We believe that God is our creator, who has given us minds to know God's love, hearts to love him, and the will to serve others in God's name. We believe that Jesus Christ has shown us by his teaching and example how to use these gifts to the glory of God for the service of people everywhere. We believe that the Spirit of God is present with us now and always and can be experienced in prayer, in forgiveness, in the Word, the sacraments, in the fellowship of the Church, and in all we do. Let us sing together now our call to prayer as we come to this time. And know that as we sing, you're invited to light a candle as a symbol of your prayer as well. <laughs>
gracious and loving God, from the wonder and beauty of nature as we move into early fall, to the wonder and beauty of the people we interact with, the laughter of children, the touch of a loved one, a community that cares about us, we are thankful. For the very miracle and mystery of life, we give thanks. For this opportunity this morning to stop and breathe in your Holy Spirit and be refreshed, renewed, and challenged, we are grateful. May our seeds always be planted faithfully and nurtured lovingly so that you may be realized anew in this world. Grant us the humility we need to plant and to tend our garden. Gentle, gentle spirit, for those times when we cannot see the way, take us by the hand so that we can step forward in faith. Fill us with hope so we can sing your joys all of our days. Faithful creator, we strive to carry out your will as our spirit as your spirit works through us. When we tire, your presence embraces us, refreshes us, and transforms us. We become filled with grace and love and purpose, empowered and emboldened anew to a life of service, becoming your hands and heart in our world. God of small seeds and mighty growth, we are grateful that you take our lives and with your love cause them to produce acts of loving kindness for you in this world. You hear us when we cry out and find us when we are lost and wandering in fear. You pull us close so that we may be made whole and rejoice in your goodness and give thanks. Today we especially want to remember in our prayers those in our community of faith in need of your touch. We pray for Pam Davis having surgery this week. Be with her and the whole medical staff during this time. We pray for the Wingfield family, for Jesse and Luke, for Martha and Myron. God be in their midst with the strength of your love. We remember also those in the midst of recovery from storms. The storms that brought heavy winds and rains and the storms of our own lives that come in the form of illness or grief, frustration or fury. We ask for your healing presence and inner comfort in our lives. And for others whose names rest on our hearts today, be they out of joy or with concern. Congregation, I invite you to lift these names aloud now. Mighty God, to you belong the mysteries of the universe. You transform shepherds into kings, the smallest seeds into magnificent trees. Bless us always with your life-giving spirit. Recreate us in your image and shape us to your purposes. And hear us as we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven,
us pray together. Holy One, whose heart abounds with gifts, receive this offering as a sign of our intention to live surrounded by your mercy, inspired by your spirit, open to joy in your presence, and generous to others. Amen. Let's join together now in our closing hymn. We are all one in mission. That's in the faith we sing, 2243.